This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. So Parsha's TC is an amazing Parsha. I get the sense, reading it, that you could really spend an entire year discussing it. I even toyed with doing a fundraiser, givetorch.org special to do just questions because there's so many fascinating parts of this Parsha and so many aspects of the storyline and the narrative that raise so many interesting questions. I want to do, maybe I consider to, to do this. Just like questions, the 15 top questions that make the Parsha so interesting, maybe I should have done it, but that is not what we will do. Instead, we're going to propose a theme that is strung throughout the Parsha. I think it has a very valuable idea, one that is particularly relevant and germane today for multiple reasons. It's a very interesting Parsha, really fascinating, the most jarring, traumatic event maybe of the whole Torah happens in this Parsha, but it begins with the wrapping up of the instructions to build the tabernacle. It's kind of continuing the theme of the past two weeks. And it tells us when you count the nation, you count them by proxy. You don't count 
per cap, I don't count the heads. Instead, every person gives a half shekel. But if you count them per capita, they will die. You know, the U.S. Census, we have a census every year, or I'm sorry, every, every decade, and you just count the people. When you count Jews, you don't count them per capita, you count them via a proxy. Everyone gives a half shekel. Why? What's the problem? So the verse says, if you count them per capita, you count the people, not the coins, the proxies, then there will be a plague. Why? Because when you count them, Rashi tells us, there is an ayin hara, an evil eye. And that brings about a plague. So you have all this money, everyone gives the half shekel, and the verse tells us what you do with this with this money. Everyone gives the half shekel, everyone who is of military age of 20 and older, and the rich don't give more, and the poor don't give less. Everyone gives the half shekel, and then you take the money, and the money is used to procure sacrifices for the entire nation, communal sacrifices for the entire year. So the census was also a fundraiser purchasing public sacrifices, and this was a fundraising drive that was repeated every year, a half shekel from every person, and this is used to purchase the sacrifices. But isn't it interesting that in the temple, in the tabernacle, they also did an annual fundraising drive, and they used the funds for the sacrifices. And then we read about uh, another vessel that appears in the tabernacle, the laver, the, the key or that you wash your hands and feet. Then we talk about the anointing oil, the special anointing oil used to anoint the vessels of the tabernacle and the kohanim. And then we read about the ketores. The ketores is a cocktail of 11 spices and herbs, including the rancid chelbana that are burnt on the inner golden altar every day. And it makes a beautiful aroma when mixed together and the whole city is awash in this wonderful fragrance. And then we read how Moshe is told to appoint Betzalel to oversee the construction of the tabernacle and its vessels and the various vestments of the high priest, along with a talented team of helpers. And we read about Shabbos, and finally we get to the end of chapter 31, and we read the iconic verse, Vayitena Moshe Gagiv to Moshe, when he finished speaking to him at Mount Sinai, he gave him Luchot Ha'idut, the tablets of testimony. Luchot Evan, tablets of stone, Suvim Bespalukim, written, inscribed with the finger of God. So if you stop the Parsha at that point, you would say, all is well, things are wonderful, things are swell, we have all the instructions, we have appointed now Batsalel and Co. to oversee the construction, we have the Mitzvah of Shabbos, and we have the tablets, things cannot go any better. Now, Rashi reorients us chronologically and tells us that the subject matter of this part of the Parsha, the first part of the Parsha, and the previous two weeks, Parsha's Truma and Tetzavah actually happened before the events of chapter 32 that we're about to read about. We know the Torah is not necessarily written in chronological order. Okay, so in the next verse, chapter 32, verse 1, chaos erupts. The nation sees that Moshe is delayed from descending from the mountain. And they gang up against Aaron, and they tell him, make for us a god, a deity, a leader, that shall go in front of us, because Moshe, this man Moshe, is gone. We don't know what happened to him. And Aaron seems to capitulate to their ridiculous demands, and he tells them, okay, give me the gold, give me the gold, earrings that you have, jewelry that you have, and they do it, they give him the gold, and he takes it and he puts it into a crucible, and he makes a golden calf. What is going on here? And the nation says, well, this is our God that took us out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron proceeds to see something and to build an altar, and he says to them, okay, tomorrow we're going to have a festivities, a festival, a celebration for God. And they wake up early in the morning, and they bring sacrifices, and they offer peace offerings, and they eat, and they drink, and they get up in revelry. So this is a total disaster. It's been only 40 days since the Sinai revelation, and something amounting 
to idolatry is happening, the nation is constructing the golden calf with the aid or with the participation of Aaron, and now they're offering sacrifices to it, and they're dancing, and there's this whole revelrous, idolatrous atmosphere. What is going on? And then verse 7, we read how God tells Moshe, go down, descend, because your nation is messing up, they're doing terrible things. They have deviated from the path that I instructed them. They made a golden calf and they bowed down to it and offered sacrifices to it. What a disaster. Now Rashi, as he always does, gives us the behind the scenes of what actually happened. Moshe had given them the time frame when he is going to be back. And they thought Moshe was supposed to be back. And uh, the time, the appointed time had arrived and Moshe wasn't there. And the Satan tried to trick them. He made it dark and confusing. And he showed the Moshe being transported in a heavenly coffin. And the nation's freaking out. And they're demanding a replacement. And Hur, Moshe and Aaron's nephew, the son of Miriam and Caleb, he tries to reason with the mob tries to stop the mob from this insane plan that they have to make a replacement that's almost like an idol. And the nation, the mob, kill him. And then they come to Aaron. And Aaron knows that this is a terrible idea, but he understood that they would kill him too. And Rashi tells us that Aaron knew that in the event that they killed him, they would have no atonement. Why? Because scripture tells us, if you kill a priest and a prophet, if there's a priest who's also a prophet, which at this moment, there's only one person like that in the world, that's only Aaron, only Aaron who's both a priest and a prophet. If you kill a priest and a prophet, there can be no atonement. So Aaron knows that they're demanding from him to build, to construct, to create an idol And if not, they're going to kill him. If they create the idol, they're in big trouble. But if they kill him, they are in worse trouble. Because idolatry is something that can be atoned for. Killing a priest who is also a prophet is so unconscionable and so irreversible and irrevocable that that would prevent them. That would preclude them from ever repenting. And therefore, he says, I'm going to play ball. But he tries to delay. He says, well, give me your gold. Who wants to part with their gold? Most people don't want to do that. Let me think about it. Let me speak to my wife. Let me think about it. But they were too eager. He tries to delay. I'll build the altar. I'll do it really slowly. He tries to push it off to the next day. Well, let's let's reconvene here tomorrow. He tries to stop it, but to no avail. And then he takes all the gold and throws it into the cauldron. And members of the mixed multitude, namely Egyptians, not part of the Jewish family biologically, but people who are Egyptian that joined the nation with the Exodus, they were much more connected to idolatry and sorcery. And there was one person in particular that had access to a special magical metal plate, the same metal plate that Moshe used to extract Joseph's bones from the bottom of the Nile. And on this metal plate, it said, Alei Shor, arise, O ox. And Joseph is compared to an ox. So when Moshe threw that special, magical metal plate into the Nile, the bones of Joseph floated to the top. The ox, so to speak, arose. So one of the mixed multitude, one of these rabble-rousers and problematic people, snatched that magical metal plate and said, I may use this in the future. Aaron throws all the gold into the cauldron, into the crucible. And this whippersnapper takes the metal plate that says, Arise, O Ox, throws it into the crucible. And guess what pops out of this crucible? A little ox, a golden calf. And then at least on some level, the nation or parts of the nation worshipped this idol. A total disaster. And God tells Moshe, 
your nation, blundered big time, go fix it, or go try to fix it, go down, go descend. Now the whole rest of the Parsha, really the rest of the Torah, but really the rest of history is dealing with the consequences and the fallout of the golden calf. So God tells Moshe, go down, descend, because your nation has become corrupted. Rashi points out that the verse does not say because the nation has corrupted. It says because your nation has corrupted. God is telling Moshe, you are responsible. It's your nation that has done this egregious sin. Why is Moshe responsible? He's not even there. So Rashi tells us something fascinating. This is Moshe's nation. When the exodus was happening, the Jews, of course, at least 20% of them, were leaving. And a group of Egyptians, the mixed multitude, says, we want to join as well. And Moshe consulted with God. And God said, it's a terrible idea. Let them stay here. Just go out yourself, the Jewish nation. Don't bring these people. They could be problematic. And Moshe says, no. Isn't it wonderful? We have these converts, potential converts, who want to come cleave to the Shekhinah, cleave to God. Let's accept them. And God says, okay, accept them at your own peril. So Moshe accepts these people. And therefore, he's responsible for these people. And therefore, when they do the golden calf, God says to Moshe, this is your nation You, Moshe, it's your nation that is corrupting over here, that is destroying over here. Go fix it. This is on you. And then God says to Moshe, I want to destroy the whole nation and start from scratch with a clean slate with just you. Allow me, he tells Moshe, let me get angry at this nation. Let me destroy them completely and I will make you into a great nation. So Moshe responds and Moshe intercedes on behalf of the Jewish people, but in a staggered fashion. He first intervenes and prays in heaven. And he tells God, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rashi tells us, you want to burn them? You're going to burn them? That's how you're going to kill them? So you're going to get rid of them? Well, remember Abraham. He was willing to jump in a fiery furnace for your honor. Let the merit of Abraham save the nation from burning. You're going to kill them? You're going to use a sword to kill them? Remember Isaac who stretched out his neck to absorb the sword at the Binding of Isaac episode. You want to send him into exile? Remember Jacob, who went into exile in Haran. And if you don't want to rely on the merit of the great antecedents of this nation, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you want me to be the head of a new nation, Jews 2.0, Moshe, is the sole forefather of this new nation. Well, if you have a stool comprised of three legs and it topples over, certainly a stool that has only one leg, namely one forefather, one Moshe, this will not endure. This is Moshe's initial intercession upon the behalf of the Jewish people. And then he descends down below and he meets Joshua, who was away from the camp at the foot of the mountain, waiting for Moshe. And Joshua says, oh, there's noise. There must be a war going on in the camp. And Moshe corrects Joshua. He says, you incorrectly sized up the revelous noise coming from the camp. There are different types of yelps. This is not a war cry emanating from the camp. This is something else. And they get to the camp and they see the revelry of the golden calf. And he shatters the tablet for the mountain. And he grinds up the golden calf into a powdery dust. And he puts it in the water and he makes the nation drink from the water that is infused with the golden dust of the golden calf. And Rashi tells us that there were three different judgments that were given to the perpetrators and participants of the golden calf. If there were witnesses and warning that someone did idolatry, then they are going to be killed with a sword. If there are witnesses, but there is no warning, they're going to die in a plague. And if there is neither witnesses nor warning, then they are going to have their stomach explode, just like the Sota, the suspected adulteress, who drinks the water, the special bitter water. Moshe's making his own version of bitter water, water infused with the gold powdery dust of 
the golden calf, this will determine if someone is guilty and they will die. And then Moshe addresses Aaron. And Aaron tries to explain why he made the golden calf. And then Moshe makes a call to arms. Me, la Hashem, a lie. Who is committed to God? Come join me. And all the Levites join. And they take up arms. And they slaughter 3,000 perpetrators. 3,000 people who participated in this terrible debacle and fiasco. And then the next day, verse 30, it's the next day, and Moshe rebukes and admonishes the nation. And he says, you have committed a grievous sin. Let me go back to God. Maybe he will forgive you. And he goes back to God, and we read something unbelievable. Vayashav Moshe al Hashem. Moshe returned to God. And he said, please, this nation has sinned a terrible sin. And they made for themselves a golden God. Now listen to this Rashi. Moshe is going back to God. And he's telling God they made for themselves a golden God. Why is it necessary for Moshe, asks Rashi, to mention the material of their God? If you make a God, it doesn't matter if it's stone, if it's wood, if it's gold, if it's any kind of metal. It's a problem. Why is he invoking the gold? Says Rashi, Moshe is implicating God. Why? Who gave them all the gold? It was God. With the Exodus, they pilfered and they emptied out all the gold of the Egyptians. And Moshe is telling God, that's what Rashi says, you are the one who caused this to happen because you gave them so much gold and you made it impossible for them to resist the temptation of idolatry. And it gives an analogy. There was a king who had a prince. And he gives him lots of food and gives him lots of drink and makes him really beautiful and gorgeous and puts on some really nice perfume and cologne. And the kid's got suave, coiffed hair. And he's feeling on top of the world. And you put that kid with all the raging hormones and you put him right inside a brothel. What do you expect is going to happen to this kid? Can't blame the kid. Blame the dad. So too, Moshe tells God, this is just an amazing thing. You are to blame. How can you blame the kids? You gave them so much gold. Of course they're going to make a golden calf. Amazing Rashi. And then Moshe gives God an ultimatum. If you accept their expiation, if you atone for their sins, if you cleanse their slate, great. But if not, erase me from your book. I don't want to be the one who led this ship down and crashed the ship and ended this whole enterprise, this whole dream of a Jewish nation. Moshe is willing to lie down on the tracks and forfeit everything because if the nation goes down, Moshe goes down with him. And God seems to accede to this next level of Moshe's intervention. He unleashes a plague on those who made the golden calf, but then the partial transitions to chapter 31, to the next stage of the consequences of the golden calf. God tells Moshe, okay, we're going to go into the land of Israel. I'm accepting what you're saying. You and the nation, you are all going to ascend from the land of Egypt. It's time to head towards the land of Israel. Now Rashi points out that God, in this verse, chapter 31, verse 1, God talks about the nation and he addresses the nation a little bit differently. He doesn't call it your nation. He calls it the nation. Previously, it was your nation. Moshe, it's your fault because you took in these, these mixed multitude. Now, it's the nation. Rashi says, Kan lo ve'amcha. Here it doesn't say your nation. Something has subtly changed. Now this is one nation, not just the nation of Moshe. This is the nation. And then again, we're following the Parsha with the cascading consequences of the golden calf. The nation loses their crowns that they had, that they got at Sinai. Moshe relocates the tent of meeting outside the camp. Moshe tries to experience God in a more tangible way. 
And God says, well, you could see my back, but not my front. He puts him in a cleft in the rock and he experiences God in a very powerful fashion. We get the second tablets. We get the 13 attributes of mercy. And finally, Moshe descends from the mountain with the second set of tablets and his face is aglow as bright as the, as the sun. He has know it and he has to wear a mask. And that's how the Parsha ends. So, of course, there's so much to unpack here. Again, like I mentioned, I feel like we can legitimately spend an entire year on this Parsha and still have more to talk about. But I want to propose an idea, a theme, that streams together many of the events of the Parsha into a single unified theme that, again, like I mentioned, is very relevant and germane in more ways than one. Let's begin with a question. We have this unprecedented catastrophe of the sin of the golden calf in our Parsha. Who's to blame? Who's responsible for this debacle? It's a hard question to answer. On one hand, you would say, well, the nation, they did it. You may point fingers at Aaron. Aaron, after all, he made it. He made the golden calf. Of course, he had a good excuse, but in the end, he made it. You could point at the mixed multitude and say, well, they threw in the plate of metal that had the line, Alei Shor, Arise, O Ox, and therefore they conjured the calf, and therefore they're to blame. Now, God blames Moshe. He says, it's your nation, because you absorbed the mixed multitude into the nation. You're responsible. Moshe, on the other hand, he blames God. You gave him too much gold. It seems like there's a lot of blame going around. Is there anyone who is completely innocent? Is there anyone that is free of any guilt? Well, it seems to me that there's at least one innocent group, the Levites. When Moshe makes a call to arms, Mila Hashem Eli, who is loyal to Hashem, come join me. Chapter 32, verse 26. All the Levites joined. Rashi tells us, Mikan Shekol Hashavet Kosher. The entire Shavet, the entire tribe was kosher. The entire tribe was innocent. So here's the question. When God proposed to have Moshe be the head of the new nation in that counterfactual hypothetical world, there's a new nation. We're done with the Jewish people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the Jews 2.0. It's just Moshe leading a new nation. Everyone else is going to be killed. Everyone, apparently, including the Levites. Why are the Levites on the chopping block? The tribe of the Levites, they did not partake in the sins of the golden calf. They also didn't do the idolatry in Egypt. They also circumcised in Egypt. Why would they go with the nation? Is that a good question? So I heard from my friend Rabbi Menachem Bressler. He quoted Rabbi Noah Weinberg, who said that even the Levites are partially guilty. Why? Because Moshe made a call to arms. Mila Hashem Who is loyal to Hashem? Come join me. Moshe had to call them. The Levites had to be summoned. They weren't so completely in love with God to take up arms unsolicited and therefore there perhaps is a little bit of blame to be sent their way. But here's a different question. I can think of two people that don't even have that level of culpability. Everyone seems to be to blame. Everyone. But there's at least two people that I don't think there's, at least I haven't seen, any legitimate blame directed their way. And they are Hur, Moshe and Aaron's nephew, who tried to stop them and was killed for it. And Joshua. Joshua, he wasn't responsible for the mixed multitude because he didn't absorb them into the nation. And he wasn't even in the camp when they made the golden calf. He was waiting at the foot of the mountain for Moshe to return. And apparently, the new nation was going to include Moshe and Moshe alone. Hur, of course, is dead now. But in this hypothetical nation, why would Joshua be killed? He didn't sin at all. Yet apparently, he too would have been implicated as well had the nation been wiped out and God started from scratch with just Moshe 
Why is Joshua guilty? Let's ask another question. God tells Moshe, okay, I'll accept your intercession, your prayer. I'm going to hold off the story of the Jewish people right now, but I'm not going to ignore their sin. I'm going to punish them, but I'm going to divide up the punishment into a million small pieces, and every punishment that they will have throughout their history will have a sliver of the effect of the golden calf. A retribution for, for the golden calf is found in every punishment the Jewish people endure ever since. But here's the question. Everyone who sinned, we were told, they were all executed. Some of them were killed with the Levites with the swords. Some of them died after they consumed the bitter waters, the waters that were infused with the powdery dust of the golden calf. And then you had the people that died in the plague. So everyone who was guilty is gone. And the rest of us are still suffering and are still being punished. Why are the innocents suffering for the sins of the guilty, the now deceased guilty? So I want to suggest an approach that I think serves as a theme of the Parsha, maybe even a theme of our organization, Torch, the Torch Center, and of course the amazing fundraiser happening right now at GiveTorch.org. The Jewish people, we are an indivisible nation. We're like one unit, one body. You cannot separate us. Just as you have a body comprised of many organs and limbs, so too the Jewish people are considered to be one entity. And we rise and we fall together. Just like, God forbid, if there's cancer in the liver, the stomach can say, oh, I'm, I'm good. The spleen is also in trouble. The whole body's in trouble. So too, the Jewish people are one people. And we rise and fall together. And you cannot rely on your personal righteousness to save you when there's something problematic happening throughout the rest of the nation. We are in a boat together and we will rise and fall as a single unit. This idea, I think, is strung throughout the Parsha. It starts off with a fundraising drive. Everyone give a half a shekel. Why a half a shekel? Why not a full shekel? Did they have matchers, generous matchers like the Torch fundraiser? The website is givetorch.org that amplify the donation. Why did they ask for a half shekel coin? So the Chida says something fascinating. This is teaching us about unity. Each one of us on our own are just a half a shekel. We are incomplete. We're half. Only when we unite together can we become something amazing. If you count the people per capita, it's dangerous. It will lead to a plague. Why is it dangerous to count the nation per capita? Why does it lead to a plague? So if you read the verse very carefully, the second verse of our Parsha, you'll notice that it's not the concept of counting people that's so dangerous, but it's the act of counting people that's so dangerous. Velo yehei bahem negef bifkodasam. There will not be a plague when you count them. Not just that, that you will count them, in the event that you count them. It's the act of counting itself is dangerous. When you count per capita, you are separating every individual that you're counting into an independent single unit. Everyone is an individual measured on their own, divided and separated into a discrete entity, separated from the rest of the nation. That is the separation of parts of one unit, and that is very dangerous. Instead, Use fungible coins. Every one of them looks the same. Everyone gives the same amount. There's a certain measure of uniformity to remember that we are one nation together. Now, of course, everyone knows 
that we're all unique, just like the organs of the body each have their own independent function. But nevertheless, we cannot forget that we are a single unit. And we have all these identical coins, and we rise and fall together. We're all the same, on one level, certainly. And if not, you risk having a plague. The definition of a plague is the lack of differentiation between people. When there's a famine, the rich are fine. They could still afford food at the now higher inflated prices. When there is a drought, the rich are fine. The powerful are fine. A plague, by definition, is a lack of differentiation. The President of the United States and some hobo, some homeless dude or dudette, they're in the same thing. It's like this one collective organism that's humanity and there's no differentiation between status or class or as they say, caste. Are you, are you high cultured or are you low cultured? It doesn't matter. A plague reminds us that we are, at least on some level, united as one body. You know, COVID really hit the United States in March of 2020, and it happened to have been on Parsha Tisisa. And I look back at my notes on this Parsha two years ago, and in that podcast, I speculated that perhaps this is the reason why we were given this plague. Of course, there are the scientific reasons, but we believe that nothing happens in the world without the Almighty. Why would the Almighty bring about this kind of challenge to humanity. So I speculated that perhaps it's because there's so much disunity, so much divisiveness, so much tribalism, so much of people trying to say, I'm different than you. So God reminds us, this was the theory, I think it's still a viable theory, God reminds us that we're all in the same boat. We are all interdependent upon each other. We can all be equally affected and infected as everyone else. The virus doesn't differentiate. Now, of course, I want to stress, everyone is unique and uniquely special, but at least once a year, in the temple, in the tabernacle, there's a fundraiser. We focus on this idea that you're no better on one level. You can't lord over the other people and say, oh, I'm good, I'm more righteous, I'm more wealthy, I'm more intelligent, I'm more special. No, you're just a cog in this big nation. That's like one body. And then we read about the Ketoros. Rashi tells us the Ketoros had one element, one ingredient, the chelbana that was a foul-smelling spice. And it was mixed with 10 other ingredients, and that resulted in something very aromatically beautiful. And Rashi tells us the lesson of that is that we should not ignore those who are foul-smelling amongst us. When we pray, when we fast, we have to include the sinners. The whole nation's got to be there. Everyone's got to be counted together. Same idea. Unity. The great people, the righteous people, together with the wicked people, together with the foul-smelling, rancid people, we're all together. We have to remember that. Rabbeinu B'chaya adds that we have on Sukkot, we shape the four species and they correspond to the four types of people and they all have to come together for the mitzvah. With the sin of the golden calf, we are all equally punished, the innocent and the guilty alike. We are one people. I think this brings us to a very important idea. We are responsible for one another. We are each responsible for every one of our brethren. You cannot retreat to your corner and say, you know what? I'm good. I'm righteous. I'm a good person. I'm a righteous person. I study Torah. I do mitzvahs. I do my charity. I observe the Shabbos. I'm good. Everyone else, the rest of my brethren, they're on their own. They're on their own boat. You can't do that. You try to count yourself separately. No. We're all part of this together. It's imperative on all of us to make sure that we do whatever we can to get everyone else on board. 
you can't say, well, you know, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the elbow, I'm the shoulder, I'm the spleen, I'm okay. There's chaos reigning elsewhere in the body, but so what? I'm good. No, you're not. It's one body. It's one people. It's one unit. We are obligated. It's imperative upon us to make sure that the rest of our nation are also aware of this. They also have a connection to Torah and to mitzvos and to the parsha. We can't just do this our own and say, well, I'm good. I'll tell you something scary. The Chovos Halvavos, one of the classic books of Jewish philosophy and ethics, he says that it's not possible to get to Olam Abba, it's not possible to get a portion in the afterlife, if you don't spread Torah and mitzvot to others, you could be 100% righteous on your own. But if you don't spread it to others, you are locked out of eternity. You have to reach out and educate others and spread awareness to others and teach Torah to others. Make sure that the rest of the participants of our trip, of our boat together, are not punching holes in the bottom of the ship. Now, if you don't do it yourself you can outsource it to someone who does do it. And I think at Torch, it's really a service that we provide. It's like a service, which is like, um, call it uh, afterlife insurance. You have a responsibility to make sure that everyone else is also elevating themselves spiritually. But you're busy. And maybe you're not trained to do this. That's okay. We do it. That's our mission here. Our mission at Torch is to connect Jews and Judaism. And when you partner with us, you have a slice of the action. You are partnering with us to spread Torah to the masses. And it's important for you to know what you're doing here. You are partnering with us to spread Torah and awareness of Jewish values and customs and life and mitzvos to our brethren. I think it's also an important idea to remember when we have this pandemic going on for years now, If this is the lesson, the lesson is that we're too tribal, we're too divisive. Oh, the virus doesn't differentiate. It doesn't discriminate. Maybe that's a lesson that we should take away. Because we know that at least once a year, there was a fundraiser in the temple. And at least once a year, we focus on the fact that we're supposed to be united as one, one people, one nation, realize that our fates are intertwined, we are all responsible for one another and for the whole world. Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. And our exquisite insight comes from the first verse of our parish. Really, it's the second verse, but the first verse is like introductory. Ki sisa, when you count, when you uplift the heads of the children of Israel, of Gudem, according to their count, according to the number, each person should give an atonement for their soul. Every person should give a donation towards the coffers of the temple and of the tabernacle. Now, the Bala Turim, one of the great commentators on the Torah, points out that the word vinasenu, and they shall give, this word is a palindrome. Like the, the name Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, you can read it one way, you can read it backwards, and it is the same thing. A palindrome. A man, a plan, a canal, Panama. It's a palindrome. The word Venasanu is spelled Vav, Nun, Saf, Nun, Vav. So you can read it frontwards, from beginning to end, and from end to beginning, it is spelled the same way. Says the Balaturim. You read it. Right to left, left to right, you arrive at the same word to teach you that when you give charity, whatever you give, comes back at you. You give, and it is given to you, and you will not lose from this. What an amazing idea. When we give charity, Vanessa knew you give, and it's given right back to you, just like you go right to left, and comes right back, it boomerangs right back to you in the other direction. By the way, our sages agree unanimously. For example, the tour writes that if someone gives stock a charity, you don't lose. 
In fact, the contrary, you get wealthy, you get more distinguished. The Rambam writes that, that a person never, it's never happened in history. A person becomes poor from giving charity. And this is not just what our sages say. This is what experience shows. I've been here at Torch now for almost a decade. April is going to be a decade. Which, by the way, I can't believe it's happened already. That's unbelievable. A whole decade? How's that even happened? It kind of flew by. What a delight. But I've been here for a decade, and I can tell you that I don't know a single disappointed donor. There hasn't been anyone that partnered with us in our mission who regretted their support. Why? Because that you don't regret it. When you give, you get, and you get more than you gave, aser b'shvil share tithe, so you become rich. What do you have to lose? Thank you for listening. Have an amazing rest of your day. A fantastic rest of your week. Have a fantastic, splendid, delightful, inspiring, uplifting Shabbos upcoming. And please go with help of the Almighty. We will talk again next week.